weeks though. That could have been last week. That could have been now. <laughs> Just been one of those weeks. Okay, let's wait a little bit to see if anyone pops in from the audience. Um, and then we will get started. I, we Rob, are recording. Thank you. Um, Rob, it'll be a couple of minutes till we get to rental permitting, but it won't take too long, I don't think. Just if Rob's listening. So we just have a couple things to do. Hey, John. Um, it is, it is hey, John. raining. Yeah. And for John, the same thing. It'll be a few minutes, probably 10, no more than 15 or so before we get to um, rental permitting. So with that, um, we're probably fairly stable with number of participants. So um, I will start. Um, seeing a presence of a quorum, I am calling this June 8th, 2023 regular meeting of the Community Resources Committee of the Town Council to order at 4.32 p.m. Uh, pursuant to chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, extended by chapters 22 and 107 of the Acts of 22, and extended by chapters two of the Act, chapter two of the Acts of 2023, this meeting is conducted by a rem via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time. Uh, this meeting is also being recorded. Um, with that, I'm going to take a roll call um, for attendance purposes to make sure everyone can hear and be heard. We'll start with Shalini, who I believe will not be in attendance today. Uh, Pat. Present. Mandy is present. Pam. Here. And Jennifer. Here. That is four of our five members present. Um, with that, we'll start with our agenda. There are no public hearings today. There will be at the next regular meeting on June 22nd. Um, our action items, we're gonna start with the planning board and ZBA appointment recommendations that we've been working really hard on. Um, I put an update on planning board just cause we're going to interviews in three days. Um, we have, all I basically want to say about that is we have three applicants for three um, positions, three openings. So um, when we declared the pool sufficient, there were five applicants at that time, only three submitted statements of interest. Um, one, one of those five specifically wrote me withdrawing too. So, so I knew one had withdrawn. The other one, I have not received any um, communications with um, in the last couple of weeks. So um, I thought I'd update. I don't know if we have any discussion or anything about that at this time. The packet is posted. The interviews will go forward on um, June 12th. I'm losing my dates. Um, that meeting I have, I had thought about just so, so you all know, because there was the potential for some applicants to apply to both the planning board and ZBA, I had thought about the meeting on the 12th only doing the interviews and not moving to recommendations. We do not have any overlapping applicants. And so I noticed both meetings to discuss their separate appointment recommendations. So the, the meeting on the 12th, if we desire to immediately move to recommendations after the interviews, the meeting is noticed to do so. Um, so are there any questions about the planning board at this time? Jennifer? Yeah, so I just, this is logistical. We have two hours for that meeting, 4.30, 6.30? Yes. We do have time to deliberate. Yes, that was the other reason I added it in once I knew there were three applicants. Okay. So then we really should be in town hall to have them, if we're gonna deliberate, because we'll go right if, into a town If you're going meeting. to attend the council meeting in person, um, then yes, uh, Athena has said that she will be in town, the town room and has reserved it for the meeting and will be able to send anyone who's in town hall, if there's more than one, um, the audio through so that there is no feedback. So um, that is ready and prepared for those that might want to attend the virtual, planning board, the virtual CRC special meeting in person. Pam. Thank you. Does Athena want to know how many people who might be sitting in the town room? Athena? I'll be I'll be there ready in case I'm imagining there's going to be at least one committee member who will be there in person, <laughs> right? Yep. So I'll be there at uh, before 430 to have everything set up 
So you can come and set up. We do have a different Zoom link for the council meeting, just so you know, you'll you'll log off the CRC Zoom and back into the council Zoom at 630. So I, I, um, I made the decision to notice it only as a virtual meeting with no in-person attendance of the public there. I thought it might get kind of confusing um especially if noticed like that if we had some applicants choose to come in person instead of by zoom and that that might create some equity type issues um <laughs> so so that's why it's that way um so we'll we'll see how that goes but um that is how it's noticed for that any other questions regarding Planning board appointment recommendations. Seeing none, we're gonna move on to ZBA. Um, the update, the meeting for the 15th is posted as required by the um, policy. Um, interview questions are required to be sent out today. We have not adopted them yet. So <laughs> I will send them out right after the meeting um, to the applicants and then I will send them and put them in the packet and I'm waiting for one more update. So instead of having Athena enter the packet in twice, um, once for the interview questions and once for one more update, um, I'm just gonna send both to Athena tomorrow. Uh, I'm waiting for the ZBA to meet tonight to see which hearings they are continuing um, to, get, to put in the packet a potential motion sheet so that we have the numbers. It's looking like ZBA, may not actually have any hearings continuing on past June 30th. Um, but they have two tonight. Um, and those two may or may not close tonight. And so I want to have the most up to date motion sheet draft for the packet um, for ZBA because when you're starting with continuing stuff, it's it's better to just it's easier to have the language to see what's going on. Um, so I'm gonna put that in once I get an update from Rob Wachilla about what goes on at ZBA tonight. And there's one other hearing noticed for the 22nd that they haven't picked their panel yet. So I don't know who for that one, who's going to be on that panel and whether we might or might not have to um, extend terms for whoever's on that panel. Rob has indicated that the hearing on the 22nd he does not expect to continue past the 22nd, but um, we obviously, if we don't have that hearing panel by the 15th, we can't make a recommendation, but I'm gonna be keeping on it to make sure once we know that panel um, that it's covered by the council agenda on the 26th, because the meeting will have to be, the council meeting has to be posted before we know whether it gets continued on the 22nd or not. So, so I'm on top of it, but, um, that, that's the other document I hope to add to the packet tomorrow is just sort of a draft motion so that people can see what that motions, those motions look like. Jennifer. So I, um, with the ZBA candidates, I believe one um, is specified. I don't know if he did that he only, he would like to be an alternate, but are the others applying for either full or alternate? So I have not actually read any of the statements of interest yet. In the emails I had that I received, I believe one indicated they wanted full and one indicated they wanted associate. When we pop up the question responses, you'll notice that one of the counselors, uh, I'll say it was me, added in a question that specifically says, we should ask people what they want <laughs> so that we know as we deliberate. Um, and we've never, you know, so formalized that request. So, so that'll be there, but that's a great question. It actually kind of moves us into the interview question, talking about the interview questions. Um, so any other questions on DBA before we move to looking at the interview questions and what counselors wanted, feedback we got. Seeing none, I'm gonna share um, the questions. These, what you see here were the questions that were, right, okay, now you can see it. Um, what you see here are the questions that were used at the last, I, I will, give me a second. <laughs> I will expand it. At the last um, ZBA um, interview, oops, hold on. I'm trying to do one thing. And what I'm adding onto it 
yeah. is the questions that were received from counselors. So, um, and we can go through it um, as we get there. I think there were requests to revise questions three, four, five, nine at and add a question. So we'll start in order unless people have other requests for questions, we'll start with the revision to question three. Um, right now it reads, do you understand the role of the ZBA and how it differs from the role of the planning board? And a counselor said a, a new wording could possibly be, please explain the difference between the role of the ZBA and the role of the planning board. So any preference on which wording? Here is the alternate wording for question three. And it says the same thing. It says the same thing. It's just instead of a do you understand, which could be answered with a yes, it asks someone to explain it. Um, Jennifer? Yeah, I don't have a strong preference, but I could see also the do you understand may sound like it could be a little, somebody might take a little offense to that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So maybe we could go with the, um, yeah, I'd be comfortable going with the suggestion for the revision. I don't have a strong feeling, but. So that's what it would be. The next one was um, for number four. I have no idea why this renumbered. Maybe I can figure it out. Oh. I have no idea what's going on. Okay, I'll fix that later. Yeah, fix um, later. <laughs> I got a, a number gone. Um, the next one was question number four, um, which is now listed as three for some reason that said, when interpreting a provision of the zoning bylaw, should the ZBA consider original tent of that provision, its common sense meeting and or something else? Um, and the Question, the consideration was, if we're going to say something else, maybe say, please describe other factors than original and, you know, something like that. So um, instead of maybe something else, original intent of the provision, common sense meaning and or other factors, or I didn't get a get rewording, it was just a comment to it. Pat. <laughs> I'm curious, uh, <laughs> because how do we know what the original intent of the provision was. Many of our zoning laws were written many, many years ago. So that just seems like uh, a you know, the kind of thing you do about the constitution. I'm interpreting it the way our forefathers did. <laughs> so well, it just bothers me and I don't know if it bothers anybody else. But. I mean, one option would be when interpreting a provision of the zoning, ball, zoning bylaw, what factors would you, or, you know, what factors would you consider or how, or how would you go about interpreting provisions of the zoning bylaw or interpreting it? Although mm. that's very vague because you kind of yeah. need a scenario. Pam. Mm. Uh, it seems that original intent means, in fact, as worded. Mm. <laughs> Which doesn't mean anything <laughs> because it's open to interpretation. <laughs> I don't know. It's, I don't care. It's just really kind of ridiculous. So we could try when applying the zoning bylaw, what? Well, Let me work on it while we talk about the other ones. If we could just stick with that for a second. I think interpreting a provision of the bylaw is is still appropriate. You interpret that, that is their role. Oh right, I'm not. <laughs> but explain. But basing it on original intent of the provision is what I'm having the trouble with. Of mm -hmm. course, they're interpreting it. That's why the when you it the words are there and each person interprets it through their experience. Uh, and so I don't have any trouble with the word interpret. Um, trying to get my sound down so you can. I'm trying to think of an example. Um, yeah. 
Well, there are dimensional, there are dimensional, there's dimensional flexibility. Um, there's, you know, some flexibility in some of the conditions. Um, I think what the question is getting at is, is what is absolutely strict interpretation of the words on the page or um, other. So here's an attempt. Yeah. Please explain how you would go about applying a provision of the zoning bylaw that might have different interpretations. I think that's fine. I don't know whether it's better or worse than the original. <laughs> what was the original intent? Thoughts? Well, as Pat said, everything could have a different interpretation, but <laughs> it's kind of. But how somebody is interpreting, interpreting something, it, right. I think is important, you know? So original draft or the modified version? I mean, it sounded a, a little like the next question. Like people have different interpretations. I guess they're different questions, but then you start looking at, you know, how the decision will impact those, some of those different parties. Yeah, I, I guess impacts and interpretations of, yeah, one is like, I think, you know, Pam was talking about question now number three of like, when you've got a waiver, what did it mean? Or, you know, when you're looking at number of parking spaces, a minimum of, I think we right now have minimums. Well, what's minimum versus how many should we require, right? And that's different necessarily than um, the next question that might be talking more about appropriateness of use in that area. But that's not the only way the next question could um, be in, in thought about, right? There's there's the yeah. language and what's a, what's like going to be required versus do you allow it? I don't know. They could practically be the same thing though. Other thoughts? There's also a rewording of question five. So coming yeah. back to, coming back to our original number four, um, I think the the common sense meaning, I mean I, that that's that's sort of a, implying implying that there is a way to interpret the words on the page. And I think all we're trying to look at is, do people realize that there are different ways of, of seeing and interpreting? Someone, someone, as Pat said, their lived experience may may lead them to to have a common sense meaning of X because they've seen it, they've experienced it. Um, and and what are we trying to contrast it with? Is what I'm saying, you know, so they understand that there's there's a range. Do we want to come back to this one? Yeah. Sorry for causing trouble. No, it's not you. We're still working on figuring out these questions. So question number five, um, had a requested rewording potentially. Um, it's right now, whose interests do you think are most important? Um, oh, and someone else said, get rid of the site plan review on um, question five because ZBA only deals with special permits. I suppose. Um, um, so, and and it was whose whose interest do you think are most important? Staff, landowner, parties in interest, or other residents? And someone else, the one counselor said you could reword it to in considering those with an interest in a special permit. Should the interest of one party be given greater significance than another party? That's a good way to say it. Yeah, I think so too. I think it's better than what we 
have less yeah, pointed. I'm getting rid of the site plan review on that. Yep, right here. Okay. Um, I think I just got rid of another question number for some reason. Okay. <laughs> we'll come back to what's number three and we're missing two numbers right now. So the next one um, is revising the last question to what the planning board, what we revised the planning board question to. That's what the current planning board question nine or eight or whatever yeah. number it is on the planning board list reads. Looks fine. Yeah, yeah it does to me Everyone too. okay? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wait. And I keep getting rid of question numbers. Um, and the next one was uh, uh, adding a question, are you interested in being a full member, associate member, or either? And that, and that gets, would just apply to the CBA. Right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the planning board doesn't have associate members. So, and that I'm would take care that. of the question, Jennifer, that you were asking, which right. is, how do we know? <laughs> and so we'd be evening it out by asking everyone to state their preference or say any. Um, right. I'm fine with that. Which leaves us then with back to this question 3A. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying, I, I can't follow the numbers. I have no idea why they don't have numbers. I think three A. Sorry, oh, they do have numbers. Oh wait, no. There we go. I think now they have numbers. I think you're right. See, question five seems like it could be two separate. Oh, it is separate questions. Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah. So maybe they don't all have numbers. Hold on. Five. Yeah, they're. Yep. Okay. Which means we are looking, now that we have everything numbered, we're looking at four. <laughs> Question. Comment. Um, when, so we have folks, we have folks with experience that apply to the plan, uh, to the ZBA. We have folks with no experience, um, but an interest. And it's a little, I'm, I'm thinking in their shoes, it's a little awkward to say, well, tell us how you would think about, how would you apply uh, provisions, the bylaw, you know, and, and these folks have never done that. What they can relate to is that, um, our original wording when interpreting a provision, should they consider, you know, X, Y, or Z, um, it, it makes it a little more obvious what we're trying to get them to think about rather than explain how they would actually apply a provision of the bylaw, if that makes sense to you all. Um, I sort of need it in a sentence. I'm not quite where you are, Pam. I'm not sure exactly what you're. So if I heard Pam properly, let me try Pam if, if you're willing. Um, but the original question is more answerable by people that don't have ZBA experience and people that do because it's talking more about it's clearer that it's generalities, like when you're looking so that they can relate that to 
some other by you know like they've served on a board a nonprofit board that has a set of bylaws and they've had to figure mm -hmm. out what does member mean you know and they can relate it to something like that whereas the the new wording isn't as clear that that's sort of what we're getting at mm -hmm. right thank you yeah thank, yeah i'm wondering if should the ZBA consider the intent of the provision, its common sense meaning and or something else and just get that original out of there because I don't think anybody necessarily knows the original intent. We we all use an interpretation. I, I don't know. Yeah, and, I, I was not wondering- Sandy's side if people want to keep it. I, I was wondering if we could change original intent to something like um, the, the actual language, you know, or the written words, their common sense meaning, or I'm, I'm trying to figure out there's like a term we should it, original intent sort of the wrong term, but yeah. Pat, I like what you said. Do you know what you said? <laughs> uh, uh, but, but, but let me see. Uh, I think I, ju I just left out original. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so consider the intent of the provision. It's common sense meaning, which might seem different or and or something else. Yes. Yeah. Does that and counselor one said and or I think they would say instead of something else, other factors maybe. Consider the intent of the provision. It's common sense meaning, or what was okay. the uh, little There's some other factor, yeah. Or yeah, thank you, Jennifer. I think Mandy was writing that, yeah. Like, something like that, I think, is what counselor, yeah. the first counselor was going for. If suggesting something else in the question, ask them to please describe other factors other than original intent of the provision. So, and or some other factor. Yep. And it covers that. That's great. Are we... So that's what it looks like. Oh, and there's a rewording for, no, I think this is the rewording. Where are you? I'm sorry. The, the blurb at the bottom, I think is the rewording, Pam, that you did last time. Yeah. Yes. And so we have to change question nine. Is it nine or is it 10? Well, it's nine, but 10 is, 10 isn't a yes or no, but it's also a simple answer. Yep. Will that work? Uh, question I mentioned are short answers. It's, it's not quite. Uh, Ask well, what about saying just a quick I, answer on nine? A quick and answer. Ten. I think it will, be self and it will be self explanatory when they hear the question. <laughs> our quick answer? Our yeah. short answer? I, I think it's self explanatory, as Pam says. Does that look good? Mm -hmm. We ready for a motion and a vote? I move to accept these um, questions as discussed and amended. Second, DeAngelis. Any further discussions? Seeing none, we're going to vote. We're starting with Pat. Aye. Uh, Mandy is an aye. Pam. Aye. And Jennifer? Aye. Uh, that is unanimous. I will send them out after the meeting. Okay. And that brings us to residential rental bylaw. Thank you, oh, John. And... Oh, oh, sorry, Kelly. Hi, one quick question. Um, Pam, was it you who made the motion? that last one 
Yes, thank you. that's what I thought. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for asking, Kelly. Pam. Andy, can we just clarify who is going to send this list of questions to the to the folks that have submitted their SOIs? I was planning on it simply because I have control of the document. Um, I'm happy to send that for cleanup to you to do, but I figured it's okay. I just want to be clear on who is supposed to do it. No, I appreciate that, Pam. I appreciate it. And and normally I would say that that goes to you, but the again the policy says we have to get it out today, and so yep. I figured yep. it was just simpler to do it. Yep. Um, if I had been thinking ahead, I would have had you have the control of the document. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so we're on to residential rental bylaw. I um, thank John and Rob for being patient while we got through that. That needed adopted today. So we are going to start with, um, I had fee structure, then bylaw, then regulations. I think we're going to start with the bylaw, though. We got the town attorney's opinion, um, and we got three documents, two of which looked the same to me, um, one in word form, one in PDF, which just had comments on the draft bylaw. And then there was a written PDF that had sort of a narrative set of comments with some answers to questions regarding some certain scenarios and what would the um, Board of License Commissioner's role be in some of that and some of the specific questions that we had had. Um, I guess we can talk about some of the the narrative, if you would like, I feel like it might be more efficient to go through the document, though, and bring in the narrative part as we get to some of those sections. Um, but let but talk about the document and the comments in that and any other changes that um, committee members or John or Rob would like to see in the bylaw not does not have to be solely based on the comments we just received from legal um give me one second pam from what i got back from paul i believe i had sent them the regulations but it appears that they did not review the leg regulations or did not see them um i have not sent back to paul that question yet um because i wanted to see i wanted us to go through these to see if then we needed to resend the regulations or whether we wanted to based on their comments make changes to the regulations ourselves um so i didn't respond back to paul with that yet um pam yeah in looking at the at the kp law memo um it seems like there are some in in the on the first and second page that the general comments and those raise some really good questions. And I wonder if maybe rather than going line by line, we, we at least talk about those four or five um, comments from them because it really kind of applies generally to the way we're approaching it. And I really wanna hear from Rob and John, um, you know, in some of the answers to those, if, that's, if that would work under your consideration of this. No, I, I think that's fine. Um, let me share that so that people watching, um, give it a second. It says screen share is loading. Now you should be able to see it. Um, yep. So people watching can see what all we're looking at. This is, all of these documents are in the packet and they've been sent to all counselors too, is what it looked like that Paul forwarded the whole thing to everyone. So, um, oh, and welcome Dave. I hadn't known you joined us. Now I see you on our screen. Um, so you wanted to start maybe with these first five general comments? Yeah. So the first one's in the document two in the bylaw, and that was just apparently we hadn't gone back and done our consistency yet, and they recommend the consistency. Yeah. Um, does, is the committee just in agreement with going through and making sure we always refer to the defined terms in their defined yeah. term? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> That would be a good thing. Yep. <laughs> Sometimes we forget to go back and do that. So it's always a good reminder. Um, number two is an interesting one that talks about inspections um, and emergency inspections and reasonable notice inspections. Um,
thoughts on this one. I can also pull up, um, actually, I think I can do it from here. If I do this, do you see the draft now? Yep. Okay, so the inspection, there was also a comment here about inspections, right? Can, um, can, I, urgent, read, this, can this I read item number, number 25? What, Pam? Can I can I read this comment from KP Law out yeah. loud so so people can actually hear or see? And I think because because to me it it really begs the question: Does it does this undermine our town's ability to inspect and develop an inspection program? I can't believe if Barnstable has an inspection program that Amherst can't. So, I, but I just really want to read it. It says, as it pertains to inspections, please be cognizant that the town's authority to inspect private dwellings is limited by the Fourth Amendment to the US Constitution and the Mass Constitution. While the town may inspect private dwellings in accordance with permitting requirements and with local and state regulations, Provisions purporting to authorize the town to perform, quote, emergency inspections and or, quote, reasonable notice inspections may be ineffective and subject to legal challenge. In many cases, the only way to legally enter a privately owned property is pursuant to an administrative search warrant. I find that, I find that um, unnerving. Yeah, and, and to go along with that comment, there was a comment written in the draft bylaw that is this one here that says um, that that relates to um, emergent emergency inspections that says as a general matter, and in my opinion, this was the JGM 25, if there's a circumstance where the town needs to inspect a unit on an urgent basis citing to state codes, we'll have greater chance of success than citing this bylaw alone. Furthermore, each of those codes already has provisions for inspections and emergency situations. Therefore, while you may wish to keep this language for consistency, as a practical matter, emergency inspections may be may need to be conducted under other regulation schemes. Um, and then there was a there was another one up here about oh wait no. Yeah, no, there wasn't. Okay. So, Jennifer. I'm sorry, Jen. So, um, I, I guess 11 Allen Street, <laughs> I think that's what it was, or 20 Allen Street. If there's an emergency, they had to go in and it was um, unsafe and they had to condemn the property and no, you know, the residents that had to go stay in a hotel. I think that's. Um, so uh, under what circumstances were they allowed to go in and do that? I don't think they had a search warrant, but they must have had, I don't know if, oh, John would probably know. John or Rob would know. Rob. Yeah, so in, in a case like that where the fire department's responding to a call and they have control of the, the property uh, when they're on scene, they'll often call us in to look at something if, they, if they're concerned or see something that we might want to look at. Um, that's pretty standard practice on an emergency response. Um, so that's, um, you know, that's one way that it would occur. We actually don't, um, you know, we don't seek search warrants often. In fact, you know, just a couple of weeks ago, the, the clerk magistrate explained how rare it is for a, a search warrant to even be issued. I think maybe one in the entire year for the districts that this uh, magistrate covers. Um, so it's unusual and it has to be pretty extreme situations that, you know, that we would want to, um, you know, take that path uh, if, if necessary. John. Yeah, and, uh, responding to Jennifer about um, 20 Allen. So the police had a search warrant. That's, that's why they were there. And they also had an assistant district attorney on the scene. The district attorney said that the police should go in and see if they saw some obvious code infractions, in which case they should come out and invite me in. So they had control of the scene. That's that's how I was that's how I was asked in. 
Thank you, John. So the way I read this one and the comment within the bylaw itself um, is we might want to that that a rental bylaw probably doesn't the, those sections about emergency inspections might not be appropriate for a rental bylaw because you'd be doing it under the state law, which has stronger protections and stronger likelihood of success if you need to get in rather than a rental permitting bylaw. But the way I read this sentence here that says, while the town may inspect private dwellings in accordance with permitting requirements. So that um, indicates that we can. Um, I'm not sure we have we can require that they let us in. The way I read it is we say, we're going to inspect for you to get a permit. If you don't let us inspect, you don't get a permit. That um, that that's sort of the the result is not you know okay you have to give us permission the result is well if you don't give us permission you don't get a permit and you can't rent the building and if you do rent it you're going to get fined in violation of this bylaw and so that's sort of how I saw the two comments working together of we can still require the inspections um, to obtain the permit but what goes beyond that these these I think we had somewhere in there that says as long as we've given notice they can go in um, and I think KP law is saying no you can't <laughs> um, um, but what you can do is if you're not allowed in you can make failure to allow inspections sort of part of what might result in a revocation of a permit or a denial of a permit that's sort of my interpretation of these sections. Any other thoughts on this? It, it'll become, I think, a little more clear as we move to the language where it applies, but other so thoughts before? So, yeah. so to, to comfort me, it's, it sounds like we, within our permitting requirements, we, we allow and, and inspect. I'm, I'm comfortable with that. Because it, it, that comes back up again, though, when, when we talk about the Board of Health. So let's, let's keep yeah. going. Yep. And, and I agree with the two of you. It feels like it rests on this in accordance with permitting requirements. We create the permitting requirements. So therefore, that gives us rights to act in essence. Yeah. Okay. Number three. Um, Proper, in my opinion, the proper procedure to ensure compliance with the state regulations is via those mechanisms, provisions in this bylaw purporting to enforce other state laws and regulations may be unforced by means of an order to vacate may be unforceable, unenforceable. So they were talking about a specific provision where we said one of the violations could be the issuance of an order to vacate. Um, I think they wrote nearly the same thing here. this order to vacate comment was the town does not have the authority to order occupants to vacate a structure under this general bylaw. Orders to vacate are more properly issued under the various codes. Uh, the lawyer recommended striking the section or simply stating that the principal code official under the bylaw may require a meeting with the property owner within 10 days if the structure is subject to an order to vacate. Um, I guess Rob and John, one of the questions would be, would you ever issue an order to vacate under anything but those fire building or sanitary codes? No. No, I, you know, I wouldn't have the ability to. So deleting that section of the penalty part would be fine because you don't intend to use it anyway. I'm seeing nods. Any other questions on number three? So just, just so I understand, so an order to vacate can only occur in, in violation with violation of health safety fire code. Building right? code or sanitary code, yeah. I think yeah. that's what Rob is saying and John is saying. Yep. Okay, thank you. So basically, I think what the attorney's saying is we can't say, oh, you don't have a permit, everyone has to vacate the building. 
simply because there's no rental permit. Our cudgel as a town is fines for that process, not moving people out of the residence. Number four, um, the town attorney basically said that we cannot as a town tell landlords and tenants what mandate that they put certain provisions in their leases. Pam. I thought we already did. I thought I thought there were certain clauses that that um, our permittees include. Rob, does our current bylaw require certain lease clauses? The, the current bylaw doesn't require mm. any particular lease language. Um, you know, there's certain things that have to happen that ultimately have gotten into leases, you know, but it's really been the choice of the, the landlord or property manager to incorporate those either in the either in the base language or in attachments to the lease. Um, and then as you probably many of you know, it's not uncommon for the you know, the zoning board to ask for a particular language in a speed in, in a lease. Um, so it has happened that way from time to time. Uh, but it's always in agreement with the uh the 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 firm or the individual that has control over writing that lease and, and using it. Other thoughts? It, 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 were, were there any specific, um, I'm trying to remember if there are any specific phrases or clauses that we were asking to be included? Right here, in blue, um, there's the A, B, and then the rest. And so- What number? Three. Uh, L2, which um, the town attorney basically says delete the whole section. Um, but then the town attorney goes on to say, so so we had required in this draft um, a provision requiring attendants to provide reasonable access and terms indicating that if the owner does not have a current rental permit, the lease contract may become void. The town attorney has recommended deleting that section in the entirety. And then, sorry for all the white space, there's a second paragraph that says if no lease is used, um, there's documentation. Um, the, the, the owners must provide documentation to the town that tenants are made aware of the rental bylaw, rental permit bylaw and inspection system. Um, and that all leases provide acknowledgement that tenants have been aware of that. And the town attorney actually said with that one, you could, um, as, as it would be appropriate for the bylaw and the permits that are issued there under to require an owner to notify tenants of the rental bylaw, you just can't force them to put it in the lease is what I read that as, but we could require that notification some other way and then proof of that notification. You just can't force them to put it in the lease. Thank you. You're welcome. And number five is basically consider the financial and person hour impacts of this bylaw. Jennifer. Yeah, uh, what is it? I, I made a note about this. What does that mean in the last sentence? Might there be other ways to enforce such as affirmations of compliance? What is under the penalty oh. of perjury? Oh, so that means that when you sign the application, you are signing that everything is truthful. Um, and if you lied in it, you could be charged with perjury. That's yeah. an applying for the permit. Okay. Thank or you. some other thing, but yeah. yeah. Pam? That's, that's kind of getting close to um, self-certification. Yes, it did not work. <laughs> For inspections, we've seen it does not work. Um, but um, for certain penalties, maybe something like that would. I think I think they're saying consider potential other ways. The spot checks. I'm curious, John and Rob, how that might work. Spot checks, and how could we write that into the bylaw? I 
I guess I'd like to know more about what he's thinking, you know, on what, how, how that would even be applied. You know, I, I'm not sure how we would just choose locations or what we would base those decisions on prior experience with a, with a property or landlord. It seems like it'd get, it'll get us into trouble um, by just kind of picking and choosing randomly uh, where we do spot checks. So I, I guess I want more guidance on that from the attorney. Yeah, exactly. The, the, there's other um, laws that um, we're governed by that say we can't target properties or landlords. So uh, this seems like it would be getting close to doing that. Thank you, Mandy, for going through those. Oh, you're welcome. Okay. Um, the detailed questions. So most of these came from the Board of License Commissioners, so I'm not sure we need to talk specifically about them. Um, in my meetings with the Board of License Commissioners, they had asked how would the appeals work? What would their role be? What would they be deciding? Things like that. Um, and so I forwarded those questions on. Um, and I have already forwarded all three of these documents to the chair of the Board of License Commissioners for their discussion. And, and also I suspect they will discuss particularly section two, which mostly relates to questions they had. Um, so, and I think that takes care of most of these comments. Um, if I if I could comment just on yep. the the responses or the scenarios and the and the responses for um, board of health or board of license commissioners. Sure. Um, it seems that obviously our inspection department manages this now. They manage the appeals, et cetera. And I think it feels like many of these are are pretty straightforward. Um, determining if if the inspections were or the requirements or um, uh, findings were valid. Um, the one thing that jumped out on me in terms of seeming ambiguity was was the KP laws um, characterization of passing an inspection. And I think I'd like to hear from John and Rob to me, when you pass inspection, that's kind of standard language. You have to pass inspection. And it feels pretty awkward to me to have to um, verbalize what that means because it's that's pretty involved. And we'd be sure to miss, you know, miss something or mislead. Um, how can we say other than pass an inspection to if we if we linked it to meeting all local, state, and federal regulations, Rob, John. Uh, so I actually didn't have a problem with his recommendation. I mean, I think everything we, you know, would be looking at does connect or relate to a local, state, or federal regulation, uh, one way or another. So I, I I was pretty comfortable with adding that little bit of language um, if you know, he felt it was important. Yeah, it just yeah. seems, I mean, we, we always talk about passing inspection and you know what that means and I know what that means. Why do we have to further describe it? Yeah, I think, I think he, the lawyer added the language to confirm that all local, state and federal laws and regulations are met. And Rob, that's the language you were referring to that you'd be comfortable with, right? Yeah, I, that is what we do. Uh, That's what know, we do. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. And okay. So you don't. With that, I'm going to share the Word version of this so that I can make changes on that and everyone can see them um, as we go through. <laughs> We've discussed some of this already. Um, I will go through and do that. 
um, make consistent. We discussed that one. We'll go through and just make sure that we're always referencing the right definition. Um, Andy, in, in your notes, would you would you um, note that person in charge, I think, is possibly used in a couple different ways between our, our regulations and, and this bylaw? Okay. Because it's implied in some cases that it's the that it's the tenant. Um, when I think it's implied here that person in charge is the manager, the property manager, the owner. But there's no guarantee they're going to be 25 or more. So well, so, so that was one of the comments the attorney had. Um, the rationale behind 25 year old requirement and um can I basically he said, can the town rationalize why a 25 year old can serve as a person in charge, but not a 24 year old? <laughs> you know, I I I got from him reading this that. He'd probably be much more comfortable if we said 18 or older, um, because that's the difference between adult and child. You might even be able to get away with 21 and older um, because we've made those distinctions with alcohol. So I could probably make a rational argument that um, a person in charge might need to be able to legally possess various um, substances, uh, depending on what's going on. Um, but thoughts on 25 and everything. Jennifer. Um, no, I would just ask uh, Rob and John if they have any, you know, what their feelings are about this. Yeah, can you say because their brain's not done cooking till they're 25? <laughs> can you put that in there? I think there's probably some evidence for that. <laughs> yeah, given the state of uh, who the nation is supporting for political positions, I don't think 50-year-olds uh, have cooked brains anymore. Um, I really think, <laughs> I think, you know, a person at 18 can be incredibly responsible and a person at 25 can be a, a moron um, around uh, regulating something. So I think I would like to go with 18 or above. Um, that person, you know, the landlord is entrusting that person and that there, you know, there would be ramifications for them failing. I think we're getting carried away. Well, Rob and John, do you, how do you feel about that? I mean, we've had this situation already where, you know, an out of town landlord puts one of the tenants in charge. They say they're the, they're the person in charge. They're the local agent contact them if anything goes wrong. Yeah, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. When it doesn't, you know, we are there to um, use the rules. Yeah, so the problems that we've had generally has nothing to do with an individual's age. So I, you know, I personally, I, I don't care for the establishing the 25 year limit. Um, but, you know, I wonder if, if we can try pushing it a little different direction and uh, say qualified responsible adult or something, some way for us to be able to um, respond to the, the person in charge and say, you know what, this just isn't, this isn't meant to be, uh, it's not working. And that's, that's the issue we're trying to get at. You know, that, that's, that's the trouble we run into from time to time. Pam. Yeah, I was going to say the the cutoff of twenty five is that is that by twenty five, if you're if you're in school, you're probably not an an undergraduate anymore, and so that was part of the cutoff. Um, I the if we put in the word um, what was what was Rob's word uh, qualified, we we probably then have to describe what qualified means. But um, if we if I mean, I guess I could live with qualified adult 21 years of age because that is, it means you could at least have liquor uh, in your possession and it wouldn't be illegal. And 
it gives you maybe some slight seniority over other occupants in the building or the or the or the home where it's not you know the youngest in the in the crowd trying to manage the oldest in the crowd it's it's all pretty relative and it's pretty subjective yeah i i think i could go with either 18 or 21 um 18 is easier to justify necessarily than 21 although 21 can i think be justified i just in reading this um not leaving the region for more than 45 continuous calendar days. Um, the attorney didn't flag that as problematic. And I think that's where we might have the, um, we might be able to change that to 30 or 20, or I, I wouldn't want to go less than 21 probably, but um you know, if you're thinking about people and 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 all and worried about a tenant that only resides here nine months of a year being named the person in charge, they couldn't be because of that um, language. They'd be gone. You know, when you hit six weeks, you can't be the person in charge. Um, so I I don't know whether that makes eighteen fine versus 21, but John. Uh, where's that? Who's gonna keep track of that? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> uh, that's the question, right? <laughs> but... if we could eliminate that section if people are like, it adds complication that no one's ever gonna track. We were trying to get at having a local rep, obviously. Yeah. And if 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 we have a time frame that the person has to be available, um, that makes sense. However, a single family home with everybody leaving for the summer means there's really nobody there and nobody to watch out. Um, I think we were this is this particular phrase is really targeted at the property managers to make them available. So are we off target by including it? I think I agree with you that we're off target here and it is the property managers that we're speaking to. Um, so I'd like to see it removed and only focused on them. So we, I think we could remove this whole sentence because up here we say, and lives in uh -huh, uh -huh. Hamden, Hampshire, or Franklin County. So I'm not sure we need this sentence at all if we're trying to target. It also seems like if a person goes away for a period of time, it doesn't mean that they're a student. They And if they're... Right. A property manager, the property manager, their boss knows they're leaving and somebody else would be in charge. I think we're, no, no. No, I, I think you're right, Pat. Um, we have plenty of people who go away for the winter down south um, that probably for more than 45 days that might still be think of themselves as a um, owner occupied even potentially. Um, rental where they rent one unit and they live in the other except during the winter um back to the age 21 or 18. how about we just say qualified responsible adult and that kind of implies that you have to be at least 18. does that work for everyone sure yeah I think we resolved that one. Wait a minute. So so it says though the person charged shall be a qualified adult and not be a current tenant of the owner. Except as provided. So what so, does that mean? Yeah. Except so that's this, this sentence here, resident managers. Um shall be eligible to serve. So a resident manager might be considered a tenant. 
if they're paying reduced rent, but still rent, right? Because they don't own, you know, if Puffton has a resident manager who lives in one of the units, they don't own the unit, they're technically renting it from someone, even if it's at a reduced rate or zero, but they are the person in charge. So I think and that's, covered, that. and that's covered by herein. Yeah. Okay. Everyone good? And Rob and John are good. Yeah. Okay. I'm just going to go through these and then anyone who's got any other thoughts or requests to change stuff, we'll touch them later. Um, Attorney Murray recommended we delete the word halfway house and just go with group homes. Yeah. Um, so if everyone's okay with that, I will do that. Group homes actually include halfway house houses for certain individuals um, with substance abuse and all. And dorms, we've had this one a couple of times. We've talked about this a couple of times. Um, the P3s. Um, Rob, you determined that Fieldstone is not owned by the educational institution. But if it were, but it was operated by the Fieldstone people, would you want it to inspect it? So, um, I, I guess I thought maybe maybe Jonathan was suggesting that we say owner owned and operated. Yeah. And, and, you know, maybe we just take that recommendation because we don't really know exactly how these, these uh, dormitories could be structured in these public private partnerships in the future. Um, not just, you know, trying to figure out the one that we had uh, currently. Um, so I, I, I think it makes sense to say that, you know, for the, for the purposes of establishing the exception owned, owned and operated. Jennifer? Yeah, I just had a, so a general question. So I'm assuming, I was always assuming that the town would not be inspecting Fieldstone, but what if there was a, a noise complaint? How would that be handled? Rob? Uh, so a noise, uh, you know, I think that's a good question. You, you know, would you mass police respond and, and what would happen if somebody called APD would APD, APD respond? I don't know the answer to that. We'd have to talk that over with APD on how they're going to interpret the uh, the new noise and nuisance uh, regulations. I think for us, if we were called for a complaint, we would respond. You know, if there was a housing complaint, a tenant was asking for our assistance, we would we would want to help. Okay, that's good to know. Thank you. Everyone okay with the, oh, Pam. Yeah, so a dormitory owned and operated, first of all, we have we have a definition in the bylaw for dormitory, but this, so this is, I'm just making sure we don't, we aren't redundant or, or um, change the definition here, but dormitories owned and operated by the institution means that Fieldstone is not owned and exactly. operated by the university. So our, the P3s in this case, including North Village, um, would fall under our jurisdiction. Yes, so, so they would not be exempt, which means Fieldstone would need to get a rental permit. Good. And only like, yeah, dormitory is defined in the zoning bylaw and includes, its definition is broad enough that it includes Olympia Place. I think it's Olympia Place, not Olympia Oaks, right? Olympia Place, um, which is not even a P3, but it's considered a dorm under the definition in the zoning bylaw, and we've adopted that definition. Educational institution in this bylaw is defined as Amherst College, Hampshire College, and UMass. So we would have to, if a, third, if a fourth one happened to locate themselves in town, <laughs> we'd have to go and change the bylaw. Um, and it has to be in the ED district. So the dorms operated by Amherst College on Amherst College's property would be exempt and they don't have to obtain a permit. 
but Fieldstone would have to obtain a permit and go through the inspection process. Great. Jennifer. Yeah, it may just be semantics, but the university is very clear that Fieldstone is not a dormitory. It's an apartment. I don't know if that makes a difference. And do they know they're going to need to be per inspected? Okay. Rob? <laughs> Uh, no, they don't know that because uh, we we actually are not issuing didn't issue the building permits. The state inspector issued the building permits because the uh, university owns the building. So would the state do the inspections or would the town? Well, I guess that's what we're trying to establish here is okay. whether or not we would do any inspection or be responsible for any of the sanitary code violations after there's occupants. So when there's a tent, after a tenant, uh, you know, is established in the building, it seems to me the attorney suggesting that we can do this. Uh, so I'm happy to do that if he's suggesting we can do that. Uh, I thought all along we would be permitting it and that wasn't the case. Uh, and, and would be happy to, you know, make sure that we're responsible for uh, responding to any complaints that happen there. Uh, there, you know, there are state building inspectors, but they cover a large territory. You know, they're not, they're not here all the time in Amherst to respond in a, in a reasonable time frame. Any other questions with the dorm one? If not, so again, it doesn't um, matter if it's a dorm or apartment, it's still. Right. If it's classified as an apartment, it wouldn't even fall under the exemption at all. Right, right. Okay. So the comment on this one is the use of the word short, short term because up above we've just determined short, short term is 31 or fewer consecutive days. Um, I recommend we just delete the term, the, that we just delete short term so that it's residential rental property rented less than 14 days cumulative in a calendar year are exempt from the bylaw. Um, short term was defined as that to try and make sure we have a couple of additional provisions for short term rentals that only rent um, no more than 31 days at a time. Um, so Airbnb type rentals, um, this applies to them, but only if they rent for more than 14 cumulative days in a year. So the person renting just uh, Airbnb in their house for one weekend a year doesn't have to get a rental permit, but if they've basically invested in it um, and do this for more than 14 days on an Airbnb basis, they need to get a rental permit. And one of the requirements that they have to prove if they're going to do those short-term short rentals is that they've registered with the state um, to pay taxes. Because we've adopted the local option tax for short-term rentals. And so we don't wanna give them a permit if they're not paying those taxes. So I think eliminating the reference to short term here eliminates that conflict. Yep. Any other questions or thoughts on that? Everyone okay with that? Next one was he recommended referencing section M. Um, in this review of permit issuance. We're on page four, Pam. Yeah, I'm looking for M. Oh, M is just the violations section. So M2C, okay. he got very specific. It's it's the violations section. Got it. Um, yep, don't need to scroll, that's fine. Okay. I found it. Yep. He just wanted it referenced. Yep. Everyone good with that? I'm going to throw the highlight in just in case, given some of the things we're deleting, these might change. So um, throw the highlight in. 
Um, I think he fixed a reference here. Um, we had put town in general and the attorney wanted us to spe specify an individual that the applications get submitted to. So the question, Rob, is, is the principal code official the proper person? It is. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's what we've been using in the current bylaw. So I think that could be, I know you got to go through and make it consistent. We have code official, we have uh, code enforcement officer, principal code official, we use it all in this file, in this document. So um, any one of them is fine, but principal code official is what we use now. Okay. And, and, and that goes to another question. We actually define code enforcement officer and principal code official differently in this bylaw. Um, code enforcement officer references police officers and fire, uh, fire um, staff, the health inspector, all of that. And the principal code official is essentially you. Administering the program. Uh, yeah. Right. I wonder so if I they can be the same. Well, <laughs> We would have to go through, and I can do, once we get through these comments, we can do a search for where we reference code enforcement officer and see if, if you can swap out um, principal code official or not. That might be something to do if you're looking to simplify. But you're okay with principal code official here? I am. Late fee? Um, Jonathan recommended we reference renewals. So unless there are other late fees, can John or Rob think of any other late fees we might have beyond the renewal one where they don't renew their permit in time? We don't charge any late fees now. Yeah, I mean, it'd be like um, a reinspection fee that wasn't paid or something like that. You know, there'd be other, I'm sure other cases, but I don't, I don't think we need to have that included. Uh, the renewal is really the going to be the big one. So if, I think if we just put renewal late fee, that might clarify our permit renewal late fee might clarify um, Jonathan's concern. Does that work for people? But we don't do that now. I mean, if we don't do a late fee, do we have to include that? But the question is, do we want to do a late fee? So is that administratively problematic? I don't know if Rob's the one that would yeah. have an impact. No, I, I mean, we don't have a late fee now. I would like there to be a late fee. Uh, you know, it is something that that takes a lot of time to to chase after applicants that do not renew on time. So I think okay. this I think this is in the step in the right direction, and and it's easy for us to to manage with our permitting program. Okay, good. I know there are, I know there are a lot of very diligent um, property owners who do everything by the book and do it on time. And I would like to acknowledge that they that they don't get they don't get fined. It's the folks that that are slack about it that that need to be prompted. So the other question is looking at this, I'm going to add it to this one um, so that we reference it the same. But the permit renewal late fee, we actually specify what it looks like. Amount equal to the amount in the amount of the required permit fee. And that happens every 30 days. That potentially could get extremely steep if we change our permit fee system to be per unit. And so I guess one of my questions is item number one under fees, all fees, including but not limited to residential rental permit, initial inspection, renewal inspection, reinspection, complaint. I made up as many complaints, the fee names as I could think of, no show, appeal, transfer, and permit renewal late fee initially determined 
do we even need number two then? Or should we leave the late fee determination? Because two almost means one shouldn't even be included because we've already indicated what two the late fee would be in number two. I worry that that could potentially be steeper than we're thinking. Although maybe Rob's happy if if the permit fee for an apartment's $400, $500 cuz we've done the steps, would you want the late fee that much? I it seems kind of steep. We this this is a small number of cases that, you know, would be really concerned about this anyway um, but for those 20 or 30 and john might know the number more precisely that we're dealing with right now we've chased all year and now they're we're looking at renewing the permit for the next year and they got a free year essentially you know yeah. so I, i'm not concerned about how high it gets you know nine months into the program uh, on a property that had had permit previously and didn't have one this past year. I, I just don't think there's any excuse for that myself um, and hope that this will help discourage. We want that to end. We don't want, you know, we, we want, we don't want to collect the fine. We want it to, we want people to renew on time. So I guess the yeah. question is, do we leave what this fee is in the bylaw or do we move this definition into our fee schedule? I think the bylaw maybe uh, can state that there will be a late fee and then the schedule can be can establish what it is. So we can eliminate the we don't have to describe here that it's double the fee or every 30 days, just that there will be a late fee. I'm I'm adding it to the document that I'm tracking the, the late the fee schedule for. Okay, so that means we would delete it here. Is everyone okay with that? It's referenced up here as part of as one of the fees. So we haven't lost it. We're just yeah, I can see it. where we haven't lost it. But um, that every 30 day thing, if if we're giving that up in this in the other section, and then we want to impose that is that problematic in terms somebody could fight it because we don't we didn't do it for someone else is there a question of consistency that we need to think about so i have basically copied this entire sentence into the working fee schedule that if we have time today to get to i'll show you and it will be in the next draft of the fee schedule so that would be the document we would be planning on sending over to um to finance to work out mainly the permit and inspection fees, but we can put some of the other ones in there as recommendations. Um, so we won't have lost it. It's part of the regulations and fee setting provisions shall be initially determined by the council and amended by the board of license commissioners. Okay. I'm, okay. I'm okay with that. If, if in fact it shows up on the other schedule because Otherwise, in in a way, we would have to describe each and every one of those fees in this in this document here, and that doesn't make sense either. Yeah. Okay. Next is the passing comment. But excuse me. While we're, excuse me. While while we're on it, oh, though, yep. we have we have now the new number two transfer of complaint inspection fees. Is that still valid? So I think, so that one is, is basically saying when someone calls to complain about compliance with the, say the sanitary code, actually say the fire code and, or the building code, building code, because the building inspector is here, <laughs> the building code. Um, and the, the, John goes out to inspect it because he received a complaint. 
that we are authorizing a fee be charged for that under this bylaw. So I, I guess you'd only be able to charge it if there was a rental permit associated with that property because it's under this bylaw rental permitting. Um, that fee that is charged, what number two says is for that complaint inspection, the inspection that happened as a result of a complaint that was called in by a tenant say, the landlord can't say, oh, tenant, you have to pay that fee. They can't transfer that fee to the tenant. Okay. I think yep. that's, you know, we haven't said that for the rental permit fee or the initial inspection fee or the renewal inspection fee. Um, the reinspection is when one of the inspections gets fails. Um, we haven't said for the no-show fee. Um, you know, and so I guess the question is, do we need it in there? I think it's nice to put in there for the complaint one because the tenants might worry that if they call in a complaint and the fee is $150 to come out, that they might be charged that $150 and we don't want them to worry about complaining about a violation. Now, the question though remains, I, we've gotten some questions. Um, I think all of us have seen them from a resident about a new state law regarding the Board of Health having to go out and inspect something when receiving a complaint or the health inspector. Um, Rob, maybe you know about this. I don't know too much about the law um, and not charge for that inspection at all, it sounds like. And so how does this relate to that? Can we even charge a complaint inspection fee at all? I guess the question would be, John. And yeah, so I read that email. Um, this is not something new. When someone calls in a complaint uh, to the Board of Health, we, we go, we have to go, we're mandated to. That, that didn't change. What happened was a new, you know, the housing code got updated and that's what um, got sent out. So we, start, we started using a new code, which is basically just a renumbering of the old code, but it's, there's nothing new about, you know, they're gonna come to your house and do an inspection. We already have to do that. Can you charge for that inspection though? So the, the issue is that the tenant cannot be charged. Hmm. And, that, and I think that this language that we have in our bylaw is consistent with the language that's now updated in the new sanitary code. Uh, it's not that there can't be a fee for, for the service, the tenant cannot be charged. Hmm. Okay. So you think, it, I, the attorney didn't flag it Rob, you think it's fine based on the laws you've seen and all? I, I think it, it serves exactly what you said. It, it helps, uh, it helps a, a tenant understand that they will not be charged, which is exactly what would happen. They wouldn't be charged uh, because of one of our other laws uh, that wouldn't allow it anyway. Are we ready to move on? The next one was the, the attorney's questions about passing, what passing an inspection means. He added language um, that seems to cover that issue. And so I think he covered his question himself. I'm not sure we have to add any other language. And then he asked about does the town intend to inspect every dwelling unit annually? That's covered in our regulations, which was one of the comments that I made me think he didn't get the regulations, but on the fact that we didn't get comments back on the regulations. Um, so I think we've taken care of through the regulations. Does anyone have any other comments on that one? He added the word, he changed shall to may in the search warrant and added the word competent in there. Um, that was, we had that the principal code official shall seek a search warrant whenever an owner fails to allow inspections. Um, and he changed it to may. I think that's logical. It sounds like Rob's not going to go out every time. Um, I think our 
what what we as a town can do is not issue the permit. Does that work for you, Rob and John? The discretion? It, it works for me. Any concerns about that from committee members? Moving on to regulations, Jonathan Murray notes that if the town council doesn't pass the regulations, then the board of license commissioners can't do anything with them. Um, that was just a notation. We've got them drafted. We hope to pass them as a council the same time this gets passed. So we're gonna bring them together. So I'm not too worried about that comment right now. Um, and the next one is our disclosure notice. Jonathan thought that if we wanted it to go to just those that currently had permits and were selling, that it might be doable. But if we wanted it to go to all residential rental property sales, that it would be difficult to enforce. Thoughts? Can we break this down into two pieces? So if we have providing written notice of the requirements to prospective purchasers, that would be that would be the effort to notify all re, re, realtors who work in the area. Does does that work? Is that part of it? Is that part of it manageable? Wait, could you say that again? I'm not quite sure I followed you, Pam. If, so the the first paragraph is property owners or their agents shall shall provide written notice of requirements to prospective purchasers. So that to me says we reach out and actively push notification of this bylaw to every single realtor who works or has a license to work in this area. Is that doable from an administrative standpoint? Just that just that part of it. Rob? I guess I'm just not sure if that gets to it. I mean, um, at the time of the transfer of title, it would be the attorney that would be providing the document to the buy purchaser. You know, I would just say, I just, in just practice, the, the realtor may be long gone from any involvement in, in the process, you know, by that point. Is it doable to to notify all attorneys working in land real estate law of the same of the same requirements? It would have to be every attorney that has a Massachusetts license. <laughs> right. Oh, we've got a list of those, don't we? <laughs> It'd be easier for us just to send it to the new owner. Mm. You know, I mean, uh, on our, our monthly transfer list is between 15 and 20 property owners. Mm. So couldn't we just do that? That seems like... We could. They're not. They're obviously not all rental properties. So it'd be more of just a notice that this exists, yeah. and it serves a purpose for both the the rented property and the the neighbor to the rented property rented property. So I think we can probably generate a a notice that would make sense. If we do it that way, I I actually like that solution. Um, if we do it that way, do we need to say anything in the bylaw, or can we delete this whole section? I think you can then delete that section. Everyone in agreement with that? Uh, Pat, uh, Pat did not, okay. And would um, we have to kind we of request were... that that happen or? What? 
I mean, would we, um, if that's not being done, I mean, we have to kind of the council request that that happen, so that the notice be sent to the whenever property changes. I don't think it needs to be in the bylaw, but how do we get that part of the system? I think we just did. We just did. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Why don't, well, yeah. No, I think it's a good idea. I mean, never really thought that through that way, but we we do a lot of work with the list of transfers already. Uh, and we try to, we basically try to pick out the ones that are not, that we feel maybe or definitely are rental properties. But I think now we can change it. We can do something different and send it off to every owner. That's great. Okay. We'll work on, we'll work on that now. I think that's a good idea. Okay. Thank you, Rob. The next one is the in each dwelling unit. Um, Excuse me. I'm, I'm oh, yeah. sorry. Sorry, sorry, to, sorry to rehash that. The wording of that, though, was, was to prospective purchasers, and and that was the that was the, the red flag was going up. You're thinking about about you know investment property in Amherst. You need to be aware of this. I I think it's great if we follow up post purchase, um, but does that does that not kind of meet the intent of that paragraph where we wanted to get ahead of the game? Is there another mechanism that we get ahead of the game? Yeah, you, you make an interesting point, Pam, because when you read the rest of it, bylaw to prospective purchasers, oh, and at the time of transfer, I was going to say the and is in there, but like prospective purposes, purchasers at the time of transfer are no longer prospective, right? They're, right. they're buying. <laughs> so so it, it's not the... And then the disclosure language we came up with was to inform buyers of the requirement. So we were almost inconsistent within the whole paragraph as to who we're aiming this at. So who are we aiming this at? Yeah, I, I mean, I wonder if we can go with I love Rob's idea. I think that's great. But Pam, you'd suggested something about the realtors. I wonder if we can encourage the realtors that generally operate in town to let prospective purchasers or something know. No, I don't know how that would work. Again, we probably can't require it thinking about the contract language, right? That we can't say, hey, realtors, you must put in your listing X, Y, Z, right? Um, thinking about the comments later on in this bylaw, but maybe the town can work with the realtors and say, hey, please let prospective buyers, if you think they're gonna rent it out, know about the bylaw. John, maybe he has a better idea. I mean, yeah, we can, we can go and talk to them. When I first started doing this work, we had a lot of problem with realtors representing properties off what they read on the, property cards you know so the assessors say it's a three family well you know maybe it's not a three family and so i went around to all the local realtors and did trainings with them um you know at their monthly meetings about how to conduct research about a property and how not to say it's something that it isn't um so this is this would be easy enough look at when you when you're selling a property that's a rental property um think about making the new buyer aware that there are some town responsibilities. So, so handle this as a, as a training. Yeah. I think that works. We'll do about five more minutes and then we're gonna move on because I'm determined to end this meeting totally on time. I think this is all we're gonna handle today. Um, as we get through some of this, but Jonathan talked about permits and where they could be displayed. Um, he had some language. Um, I thought tenants should be able to find it too. Yeah. 
Are people okay with that language? I, I was a tenant once that had this displayed in my house. Um, it's pretty ugly because it's like an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper that you don't necessarily want to stare at every time you open your door. <laughs> um, I was pleased that our, our landlord stuck it in a, in a basement door that we saw every time we went down the basement, but it was easily found easily. It was not hidden. It was, you know, in, in a location that I thought was perfect in some sense. They're knowable, but also not ugly in some sense, not where every visitor comes in and sees it type thing. It's not art. I'm, no, I'm it's not. A little trouble. <laughs> I'm having a little trouble with uh, uh, displayed in each dwelling unit at such prominent location, or do you mean in a prominent location? Oh, yeah. That, that better, Pat? I think so. What do you, yeah. There we go. Consent. We talked a little bit about this already. Um, Jonathan added some words about sufficient grounds and reasonableness. He's an attorney, so he changed some words to more attorney-like language. Um, he would strike this entire section. Um, but as it relates to this part here, he would put that, or he, Jonathan suggested it would be okay if we made that a requirement of like the application or something. Um, you know, confirm that you have made your tenants aware or something like that. Um, but the requirements are these requirements. And so if we're striking the section, I'm not sure we need to add notice to the tenants. You know, notify tenants of the rental bylaw. We've already basically required them to do that, I think, by requiring, you know, we required them to, we required them to do it um but not force them to include it in a lease yeah yeah i think they took a box on the application now that says they did it right i just paging back up here this one here written notification may provide it including disclosure form or addendum to a purchase and sale agreement i think if we deleted the first part we delete this one too I have no idea why it was a separate number. Um, yeah, the display and use. And then I think our app, I'd have to go back to the regulations, but I think we require them to, in the application, confirm that they've told the tenants. So Well, the notice to tenants number three is is just for uh, inspections. Yep. Right, and so I I made a note here um, that we need to I need to check the regulations to make sure that what Jonathan's suggesting require an owner to notify tenants of the rental bylaw that we've included that in the regulations somewhere. Well, we do require the distribution of the owner, the tenant information sheet. Yeah, that's true. So that's yeah. right there in disclosures and notifications above in number four. Oh, yeah. This, this information sheet. So we've covered that.
tenant authorization. Jonathan here thought um, I, I mean, I interpreted him as saying we could delete at least new items three and four. Thoughts? Actually, he doesn't suggest deleting them. He just says they might be. I'd, I'd like to hear from Rob and John. Yeah. Uh, they're really talking about additional inspections, which I guess would be follow-ups. I guess the re-inspection. Oh, the probable cause might have been what he had problems with. Oh. It's more of the emergency inspection. Yeah, this goes back to the earlier conversation about just showing up and doing a spot inspection, which we can't do. Yeah. I think we leave it in. I've suggested deleting the probable cause thing because that goes back to that spot inspection thing um, and the emergency inspections that he's talking about there. He doesn't say that it's awful to have it in. He said, you may wish to keep the language for consistency as a practical matter. Emergency inspections will be conducted under other regulation. So he was mainly referring to emergency inspections. We're talking, and so I think that was this probable cause type section other thing other than that it, it's covering sort of the reinspections and stuff like that is everyone comfortable leaving it in the way i've got it now with that i think how much do we have left um although just two more things we'll do it and then we'll move on um, order to vacate, Jonathan said we should delete as we can't do that. Um, the question I think for Rob and John are, do you want the, Jonathan suggested, uh, require a meeting with the property owner within 10 days of an order to vacate? Or would you rather this language just be deleted? No, uh, we don't, I don't think we need to have that language that that Jonathan suggests or the offering as a possibility. I think we can leave that out. Thank you. So we're just gonna delete this. In other words, in other words, we don't have to put in the bylaw that that people can be vacated under duress or in case of an emergency. We don't have to include that because it already exists. It's already a possibility, right? It's already a possibility under the sanitary building or fire codes. Yep. And Jonathan recommended we give Rob more discretion and flexibility for suspension. Rob, what are your thoughts? Well, I'm okay with that. Um, <laughs> the, you know, but I do understand where this was coming from is, you know, trying to prescribe things happening, making sure things are going to happen. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm comfortable either way, but I'm certainly always uh, in favor of having more flexibility in dealing with the situations because they're all so different. Many thoughts. Can we say maybe, uh, maybe for up to six months?
if they do clean it up over the summer, they're eligible to refill it with people. Think that works? And those are the last of those comments. Um, I will make a new draft doing all of this. And then the next time we get to this, which will probably be July, we will um, take any other final comments and then hopefully make a vote. And I will um, send the regulations. Should I take a pass at the regulations to see that they conform with whatever we changed here and then send them back off to Paul asking for legal review of those? That would be wonderful. Right, if you don't mind doing that. <laughs> I will do that. Um, I will do that. We will have, um, I don't think we'll get to it our next meeting, the 22nd. So we're looking at July um, for it. So, yeah, and we need to talk about the July meetings, but um, that's, we'll see what happens with the 22nd in terms of hearings and stuff um, as we try to get this through. And we'll deal with, bylaw should take a lot less time next time we see it because we've been through everything. We'll deal with regulations and firm permit structure. Again, um, I'd really love to have this one out to the council by the end of July. <laughs> we're, we're six, seven months past when we were hoping. Um, July, August, that gives me. Well, we need to send the fee off to finance, right? We were going to do that, um, but we wanted to send them a structure at least, um, but leave it to them to figure out the numbers. Pam. Can you recap? So June 22, we're talking about fee structure and- Well, and June legal. 22, we have the hearing on zoning bylaw. Oh, right. Uh, so I can put fee structure on. My guess is the hearing will take most of the time, um, but I will put fee structure on. Um, but I don't think we'll have regulations back by then. Um, let me talk about next agendas when we get there. We are not doing, let me just move on to the rest of our agenda this time and then we'll recap next agendas. Um, we're skipping discussion items. We're skipping the rest of the residential rental permitting. We're moving on to general public comment. Public comments on matters within the jurisdiction of CRC will be welcomed at this time um, for up to three minutes. Um, residents, if, if you want to make public comment at this time, please raise your hand. Oh, I just noticed we have no attendees. So I open public comment and I am closing public comment due to the fact that there are no attendees. We were that boring today. <laughs> Minutes, um, I will make the motion. Are, are there any? No, there were. So um, we put that in. Pam, do you have that up on your screen? Um, I don't. Hold on. Oh, I can get it. Oh, because I hadn't, I, it's not in the packet. So, so give me, let, let me, let me do this. There are some requested edits to the um, minutes. So let me pull that up on the screen. Um, no, so I think it is in the packet. Did I? Yeah, it says minutes it? and then edited minutes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, the edits are, hold on, we can't see half of them. In yellow, um, I believe Jennifer wanted some edits to how she expressed it. And then in red, I think we're Pam. Apple, come on. Yep. Jennifer. Yeah, just so you don't think I'm, I actually did go back and listen to it because when I first read it, I said, oh, like I say that. So this is consistent with what I said. <laughs> I'm not just trying to sound more eloquent or whatever. <laughs> okay. Oh, and then there was just some small changes. Yep. I think that's it, right? So it's basically these two things here. Any other changes beyond these two? Um, and everyone okay with these two? I guess when we vote, we'll know. 
Um, so I will make the motion to adopt the, uh, what is this, May 25th, 2023 um, meeting minutes as edited. Is there a second? Second, Rooney. And seconds, any further discussion? See none. Um, I'm an I. Pam. I. Jennifer. I. And Pat. I. That is unanimous with one absent to adopt those minutes as edited. Pam, thank you for taking care of that. You have you sent me the document, so I know you've got them. <laughs> um, with that, we are on to let me get my agenda up here. Announcements. Just we've got two meetings next week. Um, special meetings for interviews. Um, and then we have the meeting on the 22nd. Um, next agenda preview. So this is where we were talking. So on the 22nd is the hearing, continued hearing, and I will put fee structure on. I think that'll cover the whole meeting um, is my guess. We may not get to fee structure, but just in case the hearing actually ends quickly, we'll be able to continue our work on fee structure. Um, I can put the bylaw on just in case, but um, maybe I will. I won't put regulations on because I know we won't have that back from the attorney by then. Um, the meeting after um, is a meeting I cannot attend. So I guess I just wanted to make sure as we go into summer, um, Ju the July 6th meeting I cannot attend we need to make sure we have quorums on meetings. Has council ever discussed taking a month off? Uh, council cannot <laughs> formally take a month off um, because the charter requires the council to meet at least monthly. Um, so the council must have one meeting a month. <laughs> Right. The committees could. So I guess one of the questions is, I don't know what people's vacation schedules are. I cannot attend July 6th meeting. Um, we have a meeting set for the 20th. Um, what happens if we decide that none of us can make the 6th and we give ourselves a break? Part of the question is, do we want to, it is two days after the 4th. So why I am bringing this up is, do y'all want to have a meeting on July 6th um, or would after the month of June where we've had four meetings, do y'all want a break? Um, it will slow down us getting through stuff, um, but, but the question is, do we hold one on the 6th? Do we hold one potentially skip the 6th, but do the 13th or the 27th to still do two in July? Um, We've got some things we really do need to get through before the end of the term and give enough yeah. time for the council to consider. Um, I'm up. I I'm not going anywhere in July. So any if you want to move it from the sixth to the next week, I can do. I have no life anywhere in July either. <laughs> I'm I'm happy to let y'all try and finish it off without me <laughs> and continue. About, so. We could what about if we move week. it to the 13th, as Jennifer suggested? So and then we have know, one on the 13th and one on the 20th. Uh, we can try that. I will know on Sunday whether I can make the 13th. Okay. Um, we, we can proceed if we want to talk about I, I am happy to let you all. I'm going to be missing meetings in August, too, at least one, I think. So, And I don't impl in to intend to cancel it. But I, I just wanted to make sure... If, if there are quorums in July, because I wouldn't want to notice a meeting that there isn't a quorum for. Um, right. But right. if all of you can make the 6th, I would leave it up to you whether you prefer the 6th or the 13th, frankly. Um, I might be able to make the 13th. Um, well, will you know by the 22nd? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So why don't we talk about it on the 22nd? Okay. Yeah, and it would be good if Shalane we're here to contribute to, you know. Yeah, because if it's just the three of you on one of the days and the four and four people on another day, four is probably better than three. Um, yeah. Right. The six might not be good for Shalini. Right. Yeah. So I, I don't know what her schedule is. So, okay, we will bring that back up on the 22nd. Uh, okay. Any other announcements, agenda items, or, and so the sixth, we'll see what happens on the 22nd on what goes on the sixth 
but I will ask for a legal review to be back by July 1, if possible. Pam. I would like to make sure that we have our full discussions before Mr. Thompson retires. As what? much as possible, if we can, if we can cover as much ground as possible before oh, hurry up. retires. What's the date? Are you retiring? In 12 weeks. <laughs> but no one's counting. Uh, damn, what a loss. No, I'm counting. Yeah. I'm <laughs> not at all. What a loss. Um, September that gives 1st. us a deadline. Yep. That gives us our own deadline. Well, yep. anything else? If not, I want to thank John and Rob. Rob might already be mm -hmm. gone, but I want to thank John and Rob. Um, we will thank you even more tremendously when we get through it, but you guys have been a tremendous help, um, a valuable resource for us in the last year and a half of, as we slowly worked through all of this. It's <laughs> a big job. Thank you. We probably could have done you. it quicker, but but we'll get there. But thank you. I know, John, it's been a lot for you to come to these meetings. So thank you for that. Um, with that, I'm adjourning at 631 p.m. Thank you. Thank you. 32. <laughs> Who's counting? Yeah. <laughs> Take care, everyone.